Welcome to the Rush to Fail podcast. I'm your host, BJ Gramillion, and today we have Rowdy Gaines, the Olympic gold medalist uh, swimmer with us today. And you know what, Rowdy? I'm actually going to, for the first time on this show, uh, you are so cool that you have a Wikipedia uh, file already for you, which I don't have. So, And most people that come on the show do not have this. But I wanted to just go through some of the highlights, introduce you know who Rowdy is, uh, some of his accomplishments, and then obviously we'll get into this. He's been gracious enough to give me some time today and uh, super excited to dive into his story. But uh, just as a brief intro, and you'll have to bear with me here, Rowdy. Uh, Rowdy Gaines uh, was born February 17th, same day as Michael Jordan, one day before me. It's a good day. Uh, he's an American former competitive swimmer, U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame member, three-time Olympic gold medalist, and member of the International Swimming Hall of Fame. Uh, he's a swimming analyst for television network NBC. He's covered swimming at the Olympic Games since 1992 in Barcelona. And uh, Rowdy was born in Winter Haven, Florida to, is it Jetty? Did I say that correct? Mm -hmm. Jetty yeah. Uh, and Ambrose Buddy Gaines, which mm -hmm. love both of those names, by the way. Uh, <laughs> he tried several sports during his teenage years, but turned to swimming as a Winter Haven High School junior at age 17. He received a swimming scholarship to Auburn University, and at Auburn, he became a five-time NCAA champion. And so from 1978 to 1984, Gaines set 10 world, 10 world records. At the time, he was a world record holder in the 100-meter and 200-meter freestyles, and then Michael Phelps was born. That was not in there, but uh, I figured I'd just add that in there. So anyways, Rowdy, <laughs> welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, BJ. So great to be with you, my friend. Did I miss anything there? Was anything inaccurate? You 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 went on way too long. You I waxed know. on poetically. Let me tell you. No, no, it was great. Everything was good. So yeah, I came yeah. along. My timing was perfect. Uh, uh, after Mark Spitz and before Michael Phelps. So it was that's my... right. I missed Mark there too. Yeah. <laughs> Impeccable timing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Absolutely. Uh, the fact that you're uh, an Olympian and a gold medalist is, is incredible in and of itself. So it doesn't matter when that happened. That is an amazing accomplishment, obviously. So yeah. we're, we're definitely going to want to dive into that. But do you yeah. mind just telling us a little bit about your personal life, about your family and that? Sure. Well, you know, your, your family means a lot to our family, believe it or not. And uh, we just got through talking about that. We lived in Colorado Springs for a while and got to know your family really well, your mom and dad, you know, really great friends of ours and, and meant a lot to us um, and still do, your mom especially. And, and uh, so so sorry for your loss of your father, but he was a great man, as I just told you. And uh, so your family means a lot to us. But from a, from that standpoint, you know, Dude, I've got four daughters and five granddaughters. So, <laughs> wow, I did not know about the five granddaughters. I didn't know they were all. Wow. So my life is uh, full of women. Has been full of women in my life. So our our children are ages twenty four, all over, all the way up to almost forty. I think Emily's thirty nine, and then our grandchildren are six to fifteen. So uh, they're all doing great and. Uh, and my wife, Judy, is and I, we both live in Port Charlotte, Florida, which is southwest Florida, just north of Fort Myers. And uh, but we spend a lot of time out in Utah as well near our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. And thank you, Mom, for getting me this interview. I owe it to her <laughs> and her relationship with you guys. So yeah. I know she's going to want to listen to this. So we're good, you, Mom. She um, means a lot to us. Oh, man, we appreciate that. Yeah. And like we were saying, I know that she loves you guys. And uh, it's, it's fun. Every time the Olympics are on, I know that the highlight is always when Rowdy gets on the television. <laughs> uh, she, no one's allowed to talk, get in front of the TV. She is locked into the game. <laughs> um, we all love watching the Olympics with my mom. She, she's pretty intense. I don't know if you knew that about her or not, but she is very intense with sports. Um, she gets worked up quite a bit, which I inherited as well. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, the Olympics is cool because it's every four years. So, you know, I mean, it's, it, it doesn't happen often. And so when it does happen, I think, you know, the public has a fascination with it for, you know, three or four months to lead up and the build up, which we're getting very close to. And uh, and so they they love the fact that America, the United States especially, has been, um, you know, so dominant for the most part 
in the metal hunt. So that helps as well. And of course, swimming is really dominant. So that's fun to do. Yeah. Yeah. You're in the right sport for sure to <laughs> be announcing. So that's awesome. Well, maybe take us back to uh, your early life, um, maybe just high school or, or even before then. But I'm curious how you got into swimming and how did you realize that you were pretty good and that you wanted to, to you know, pursue that? Yeah, BJ, you know, it's funny. I grew up in, in Winter Haven, Florida, which is literally right in the center of the state. If you threw a dart and you'd hit in the middle of Florida, that would be Winter Haven. And, uh, you know, there's 120 something lakes in Florida. I mean, in Winter Haven. So it's 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 probably 70 percent water. We lived on Lake Eloise and my parents water skied for a place called Cypress Gardens. Wow. An old attraction. And they would literally take the boat over to work. We lived on a lake my whole life, you know, growing up. And so water really p was part of the fabric of who we were as a family growing up. I learned how to swim literally before I learned how to walk. I was nine months old, um, still not even walking. And I would crawl into the lake and float on my back. So, you know, my parents thought it was really important that I knew how to swim. But I didn't do it competitively until high school. I swam for about a, you know, uh, a summer and a half um, for a, a little club team. You know, I was like eight years old, but then I quit and didn't start again until I was 17. And the reason was because I failed in five other sports. You know, we'll talk about <laughs> failure. Uh, yeah. I tried out for football, baseball, basketball, golf, and tennis, and I got cut in all of them. Wow. So, yeah, but, uh, you know, I love sports. Um, and as a kid, you know, it didn't really matter if you were good or not. But in high school, you get cut if you're not good. So. Yeah, uh, I just never gave up, man. I, I swimming was literally just next. It wasn't like I had this grand delusion that I wanted to be good in, and I just wanted to make the team and be on a team. And so I thought I'd try swimming. And wow. how tall are you? Out of curiosity, six one. Okay, what is like the perfect height? I know that Michael Phelps is probably the the prototype. I would assume. Yeah, but he is, is. That like the perfect size yeah. or you know six one to what six four i don't know well i i'm i was considered pretty tall bj 40 years ago you know when i swam i mean i'm six one and that was i wasn't the biggest by any stretch but i was one of the biggest you know and now six one is probably on the short side you know mike huh. phelps is probably six four six five um uh, but the, there are giants out there now it doesn't necessarily mean that every tall person is going to be the best swimmer because I've seen a lot of swimmers that are not even six foot on the men's side, short women, um, that are very successful, but it doesn't hurt, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but you know, uh, you, it, you know, you have big feet, big hands. Michael has those, you know, he's got size 15, 16 feet. Uh, my feet aren't big size 10, you know, mm. I don't have especially big hands. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, short legs, big waist, uh, th those are kinds of things that you look for in a great swimmer. And certainly Michael had those and still has them, but he's not yeah. swimming anymore. But uh, yeah. yeah. See, and I, I actually love that. Like you weren't necessarily, I mean, I guess for the time six one was all, but it's not like you were just born with like the perfect physique and body and, and you just have these God given abilities and yeah. you knew right off the bat, you wanted to go into swimming. It was, it was, you had to fail, you know, through being cut with all of these, which I didn't know this, you know, about you um, <laughs> until you finally found something that stuck that you at least made the team on it. Now, when you made the team, um, like, was it apparent fairly quickly that you were, pretty gifted at it or how did that come about? No, it, 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 it didn't. In fact, the football coach was also the swim coach and he had already cut me once. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, I think after about a week or so, we had a, a, our first swim meet and it's kind of a long story, but to keep it short, um, I was on a relay with, you know, not an A, B, C or D relay. I was on like the E relay with, uh, some band members and a chess club guy. And <laughs> it was pretty pitiful, but I, I went really fast in it. Yeah. And I think at that moment, I realized this was going to be the sport that I was going to at least do in high school as a junior. Mm -hmm. And uh, my coach kind of looked at the watch and said, whoa, that's pretty good. I'm not going to cut you. Um, <laughs> and, you know, just really immersed myself in the journey, BJ. I, I, literally went to the library we didn't have the internet and checked out every single book i could on swimming um 
I researched the heck of it, heck out of it. I ordered this one magazine. It was the only swimming magazine, Swimming World magazine. I'd have that come once a month, wait by my mailbox to get it. So I was all in on trying to improve, um, try to be faster. Yeah. And, um, and that even meant sneaking into motels, not hotels, but sneaking into motels to swim in the morning because they had heated pools. And we didn't have practice in the morning. And I read somewhere where morning practices were important, you know, to your journey and to get better and to get a college scholarship, which I kind of started dreaming of. And so, yeah, I just kept doing everything necessary to get better. Wow. Yeah. So then at what point did they discover you uh, with Auburn? Um, how, how did that come about? Well, the coach uh, saw me swim the summer before between my junior and senior year, and I still sucked. I was terrible. Mm -hmm. um, but he saw something in me, and it's funny because he's now won, I think, 14 NCAA championships. He's been the head coach of two or three Olympic teams. He went oh. to Texas after my freshman year, but he did see me swim Eddie Reese, um, one of the most brilliant coaches in history, and um, saw me swim and started recruiting me when nobody else did. Uh, I, not, I didn't get recruited. One other college recruited me in my senior year, and that was it. Um, wow. Eddie was the only one. And so I felt a huge allegiance to them by the end of my senior year when I did go fast. Yeah. And uh, came down and watched me swim at the state meet in May of my senior year. I flew back with them to Auburn and fell in love with the campus, fell in love with the, the people there and the, the guys on the team. And, and so, you know, it was just a, it was a great fit. It was a small town, which is sort of like Winter Haven. It's kind of that small town atmosphere and uh, just fell in love with it. Oh, man, that's awesome. Okay, so fast forward, you're at Auburn. You're um, obviously doing well for yourself there, had some success. And so at what point do they start looking at you like, hey, this guy might actually have what it takes to, to make the Olympics? How, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, so it's funny because two and a half years after I started swimming, I broke my first world record. Wow. So it was the summer after my freshman year. I was on, it was on a relay, but I was on two different relays that broke world records. And so I think that's when that dream of actually making the Olympic team started to really be realized uh, because that summer after my freshman year, you know, made the world championship team. I won the silver medal at the world championships that summer and two relays, as I mentioned. So I, I kind of felt like, uh, oh, wow, I, I really belong it, it, it now. And uh, had a really good year my freshman year in college. And uh, I think, uh, but I think after that summer, it was like everybody was saying, you know, you've, you've got a chance to you know, actually make the Olympics. And I'm wow, really? I mean, the Olympics was two years away at that time in 1978. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I kind of set my sights for was really in, in, in after the summer of 78 on the Olympics. Wow. And was it Coach Reese that continued to coach you during that time to prepare for the Olympics, or did you have another coach? I had another coach come in, um, yeah. Richard Quick, after Eddie left for uh, Texas. And uh, Richard was with me the rest of my career, um, really. Um, and uh, he was the he was a godsend in my life. I won three gold medals, BJ. Gave, at that time, I gave one to my mom, one to my dad, and then I gave one to Richard um, after I'd won them because – he was really kind of the guiding force in my life uh, for so long. Um, so Richard came in after my freshman year. Wow. Tell me a little bit about the, the coach, because I'm super curious about, you know, what was it about him uh, that made him such a great coach? Like what what were some of the things or, or maybe uh, yeah aspects that, that just made him such an incredible coach for you personally? <laughs> I think a lot of the qualities in him I saw were uh, certainly the leadership aspect of things. He was such a great leader and he was a very consistent leader. You know what I mean? He, there, You always knew what you were going to get out of him. And uh, BJ, he was always so positive. Um, he never said a negative word ever. Really? Um, he always, yeah, he always turned a defeat into a learning experience. And I always talk about those valleys are what define us. Yeah. And I, I learned that from Richard. Um, he, 
he, I'll never forget him walking in, must've been first couple of days of practice. And he said, we will never use the words can't or don't or won't. None of the NT words are allowed um, around me because we refuse to use those because we're gonna create a positive environment through the peaks and valleys of wh where we're gonna go. And he said, there are gonna be some valleys. There's gonna be these, these pits that we're gonna have, but we're gonna overcome them and we're going to do it together. And, and he was so good at building togetherness um, among that team. Nobody, m most people think of swimming as an individual sport. In many ways it is. Um, but I think in order in college to be successful, you certainly have to have that team-like atmosphere um, and attitude. And he was so good at that. And just his energy was, was uh, unbelievable. I could go on and on about him. I, 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 I met, he, uh, Richard passed away about 10 years ago and I, I, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and I certainly miss him a lot. That's so interesting because I feel like so many coaches, they're really hard, obviously, on, on their players and they're yelling the Bob Knight, you know, kind of crowd where where they feel like they're going to get the best out of them if they just constantly nitpick and push and yell and scream. And, and it sounds like that was not your experience at all. Well, he was a yeller. Was but it? he was a yeller in a positive way. You know, it was like, he'd be on the side going, go, go, you know, let's go. Okay. You're doing, you know, he'd hold up hands to know what my splits were and everything. Um, but he was, he never did anything. I can't remember in the seven years I was with him swimming. I can't ever remember him doing anything that was negative in any form or fashion. And I screwed up a lot, dude. I was, <laughs> you know, I deserved a lot of like Bob Knight reaction, but, uh, but he so never did. Right there, you know? I mean, it just tells you the power of, you know, positive reinforcement and, you know, constant, you know, motivation, pushing, you know, and seeing yeah. the good, which obviously the world I'm sure could use more of that. Yeah. Can't have enough of it. Definitely. Um, man, that's so cool. What were, um, some some of the trials that you experienced you mentioned there were some some valleys there that did occur um and maybe it was you know in college or or what what are you know maybe one or two experiences that you had that you were like maybe even questioning like is this is this for me maybe you didn't have that what no no oh yeah i did <laughs> oh yeah um I, I mean, the biggest one for me was 1980. I was uh, entering my junior year in college and uh, obviously uh, 7980 and and uh, the Olympics, you know, we're going to be in the summer of 1980 in, in Moscow and in Russia. And uh, long story short, you know, our country boycotted those games and we did not get a chance to participate. Mm. So that was the biggest valley for me, without question, because I pretty much sacrificed everything in 1980 to prepare for that. I, I, I kind of dropped out of school and, and uh, took just minimum classes um, and, uh, you know, kind of eat, breathed and slept uh, swimming for, you know, all the way up through the trials, even though I, you know, we learned we were going to boycott back, you know, in April, but um, always had that like hope that we would still compete, but never did. But yeah, so 80 was, was, was really tough, really tough. Yeah. Cause yeah, you gotta remember BJ, the Olympics is every four years, as I said, you know, I right. mean, we, you know, it's not like if, if, if my, my team, the Chicago Cubs missed the uh, world series one year, I can always hope they can do it the next year. You know, it doesn't happen like that in swimming. So certainly one's athletic career can come and go in a span of four years and in eight years. Well, you know what oh. that means. The amount of delayed gratification that is required to be an Olympic <laughs> athlete is beyond my comprehension. Yeah. Like we are such a, a you know, give it to yeah. me now society and yeah. immediate gratification is everything, you know, just because everything is just right at our fingertips. So I cannot fathom, you know, have, especially at your age, right? When, when you're a uh, fresh or whatever, sophomore, junior in college, mm -hmm. I mean, how on earth do you get yourself back up or back on the saddle and say, okay, four years down the road, I'm going to keep training every day to hopefully, cause it's not guaranteed, hopefully make the Olympic games in four years. How in the world do you do that mentally? 
Well, and, and like I said, there were many days where I did want to quit. You know, I was never perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I, I think, again, I learned so much from Richard uh, about consistency and about teamwork. You know, uh, when the boycott officially happened, you know, I certainly considered retiring from the sport and, and moving on uh, even and not swimming my senior year. But Richard came to me and said, you know, you're a leader of this team. There are expectations put on you by others to help and you can crawl into a hole and say, what if the rest of your life, or you can continue to, to swim through your senior year and, and be a real leader uh, on this team and make a difference in other people's lives and, and live a life that you're not going to regret. And I think that's, that helped me tremendously in preparing for my senior year. And, and like I said, there were, a lot of bumps and bruises along the way, but um, so I decided to definitely go for it my senior year. And then I retired after that, um, which only lasted about six months. But, you know, again, Richard was right there for me, um, along with my teammates, my, my brothers and sisters in a way, but certainly my brothers um, on that team. Yeah. What does an average day look like for an Olympic <laughs> athlete like yourself? at that time as you're preparing yeah. you know uh you retired you came out of retirement said no i'm going to keep keep doing this you've mentioned the word consistency which mm -hmm. i have no doubt is probably the most key aspect of yeah, it is. training but yeah. what what does it look like what what does a normal day look like or week look like well a, a, a typical day it, it, let me go back for just a second right before my last race at the olympics dj we were sitting there it was a relay and we were sitting out they're trying to figure out how many miles of swimming we had done to get to this point where my race lasted about 49 seconds. I won the hunter free in 49 seconds. And uh, in an eight years, because of the boycott, I swam about 22, 23,000 miles, give or take, which is the circumference of the globe at the equator. So I figuratively, not literally, but figuratively, wow. I swam around the world. Um, so it gets you a, a, an idea of the 30,000 foot level of, of the training that, that is involved. It's certainly the sport is not for the faint of heart. We don't get beat up, not like football or boxing or anything like that. And that's, that's a blessing, but we, we certainly better beat our bodies up. It's four to six hours every day, six days a week, uh, swimming about 10 miles a day, um, including dry land, lift weight, lift weight, uh, weightlifting, running, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, as you know, I mean, you, you have to go to school too. So during that college part of things, you know, you're, you're literally, you're getting up and swimming, kind of making it up at like six to eight in the morning. And then you're, you're at breakfast and then kind of a nine to two school thing. And then two to five, two to six in the afternoon. And then you go home and Try to do a little studying and eat and sleep and do it all over again. Yeah, <laughs> and we no usually our right. our season has, has a summer and and uh, winter season, college and and summer, obviously. So there was no breaks. We got a week off in the spring, and you get a week off uh, before school started in the fall. Otherwise, it's you're full on. Man, yeah, something fascinating that I read in the book Atomic Habits, which is one of my favorite books out there, James Clear. He, he actually talked about Michael Phelps um, and uh, mentioned that in kindergarten, they said, look, your kid is can't pay attention, is not going to do anything with their life. Kind of a, you know, right. mentality like they cannot. Li he won't listen like we, we can't teach this kid. And right. his mom, you know, just wouldn't take no for an answer and obviously was like, we need to find something to channel the energy. And it's interesting because his coach then, you know, said, and I'm sure you know more about this than I do, but, you know, I guess the, the, the coach then um, said after he went to the Olympics that he had never met someone with so much focus and drive as Michael Phelps. You know, he's got all this energy clearly because he has ADD, um, but he was able to channel, you know, that emotion and, and completely focused to the point where he was he was training seven days a week where he felt that would give him an advantage. And so I'm curious, like when you were training, would, uh, would you go to that extreme or were you doing seven days a week or, or, you know, how did well, that no, we always got one day off a week. Yeah. yeah. We, we always had one day where, um, Richard was a big believer in recovery as well. And big believer in, in rest when we could get it. 
And so we always had one day off. I think one year we ended up swimming on Sundays and having Saturday off, but, but, uh, but we always got that one day off now. Um, and then, but, and then we do doubles, uh, probably five out of the six days. Saturdays usually were just one workout. Yeah. Long workout, like three, four hours. Um, wow. So we usually got that Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday off, which, it's, which we needed, you know, we, the body had to recover and, yeah. and not only the body, but the mind, you know, the mind That's had, what to I was wondering is, is, isn't that almost a disadvantage? Cause I I'm with you. I, I thought when I read that story, I was like, you need to have some rest period. Yeah. So I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, how that well, worked for him. Like, I Michael's guess. a different animal. Um, I, I've, I've called every single one of Michael's races and uh, lots of great stories, a good friend. And uh, the best story I can tell about Michael is, is really time management. You know, at, in, in 2008, when he won eight gold medals, yeah. he swam 17 races in eight days. BJ, I swam four races in eight days and thought I was going to die after the Olympics. He swam mm -hmm. 17 times. So he had every single minute, minute accounted for, right? He knew exactly what he needed to do every single minute. It was, it was out, laid out in front of him. And anyway, long story short, he was on the side of the deck during practice one day and right, but you know, an hour before the race or whatever, he's just standing on the deck and he was standing there for five minutes and his coach came over to him and goes, what are you doing standing here? And he said, I still have a minute and a half before I have to get in the water. You know, he had found five minutes and was just standing there. So, you know, it, it, and that's the beautiful thing. And maybe the ugly thing about our sport, it's, it's very, very much black and white. It's all about the clock. There is no, there is no judge judging you. It's not like gymnastics or diving where you're being judged. Wonderful, beautiful sports. Um, but it, it it would be tough to be judged for my success. And so the clock can certainly be your best friend or your worst enemy, depending on how it all lays out in front of you. And and that brings up a, an interesting point. And, and I don't know if there's a correlation or not, but I guess to that point, it, it is almost unhealthy in a way it, to a point where I feel like there are some swimmers that go into a depression, you know what? And obviously Michael's story is, uh, and sorry, we keep going back to Michael. I don't know. I, yeah. I don't know many other swimmers. I just know pretty much. Michael. No, no, no. That's um, what everybody knows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess he is good for the sport in that regard. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, it, have you noticed that that a lot of and maybe it's a lot of other Olympic athletes as well that maybe struggle with depression? Yes, uh, absolutely. After why why is that? Do you think? Because care? BJ, what happens is you you have this ultra focus for so long, man. Mm. It's four years long. And that's without the boy dot. Four years of. Of, of this grind each and every day. And then it happens. And then you don't know what you're going to do with your life. You think not everybody, but you think this is the only thing you're good at. Mm. Um, and because you've spent so much of your um, time on this one goal that when it's all over, whether you do make it to the Olympics, you do win a medal or you don't, it becomes very difficult to face the real world again because you kind of live in this fantasy land in a way. And so the depression really grabs you, not so much while it's happening because you have this focus, this ultra focus, but when it's, when it's done, I certainly went through um, a period of dep uh, depression, no doubt about it, uh, after the Olympics. Um, there were about three months where it was all hoopla. We got to travel all over the country, but then it hit me and hit me hard um, and really struggled. And, um, but, uh, but came out of it, you know, and, yeah. and uh, learned some valuable lessons along the way. And, and uh, but it, it's, you know, like I said, being an Olympian is not for the faint of heart uh, because oh. they, not in all sports. I mean, basketball has the NBA, hockey has the NHL, soccer has pro soccer, but a lot of the sports that are just Olympic focused as far as the pinnacle of success certainly can be draining on you both mentally and physically in the long run. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, how were you able to get out of that mental funk and the depression? <laughs> Cause I mean, it can be crippling, debilitating to yeah. the point where people can't, it's a nosedive and you can't get out of it. Right. And, and I'm just curious, like what was it or, or how did you figure it out? 
Well, for me, you know, fortunately, I got I, I, I met my wife a couple of years after that, and, and that was awesome and uh, kind of uh, helped refocus my energy there. And um, but I, I think even along the way, it was really important to count on your teammates because you're spending so much time with them. And then you feel like when it's all said and done, you don't want to bother them anymore. And, and I think that's the furthest thing from the truth. My, my quick story on that, that uh, Judy said, you need to tell the story is that in 1982, I went to the world championships and uh, uh, biggest meet next to the Olympics. And, and I noticed this one guy was following me everywhere. Um, and he was from East Germany. And I and, and I happen to know that the East German competitor, his name was Jörg Voisa. He was the guy that we traded times all the time. He broke a world record. I broke his world record. He broke it again. And, but I never swam against him. Um, so I didn't know what he even looked like back then. You know, this is 45 years ago. Yeah. And um, so uh, – it freaked me out. I thought it was your voice of following me around because he had East German sweats on. He'd follow me to the bathroom, get in the same lane. And it just took my mind totally off of what I needed to do is concentrate on the race. Again, long story short, he ends up beating me in the hundred freestyle by three one hundredths of a second. And it wasn't him that was following me. It was some manager for East Germany. They had it put it him in and he knew that I was going to think it was your voice and your voice was back relaxing the whole time. So I think the lesson learned from that was I never relied on me being this island again. I didn't ask my teammates to help. I didn't ask the coaches. I felt like I could tackle this all by myself. Flash forward two years later and the, I won the hunter freestyle, but I had a great start and the Australians thought I cheated and all that stuff. And, Right on the, I anchored the relay against Australia. I could hear them yelling and screaming at me saying, you know, beat this cheater, beat him, beat him. And uh, I was anchoring. It was between Australia and us. But I had a love and feeling of uh, that that great camaraderie of my teammates behind me, you know, spur me on and say, you've got this, patting me on the back, hugging me. And so I learned the lesson is never to do this by yourself. And that's, that's, my long answer to your short question about facing uh, those those trials that you have in your life is you should never do it alone. Man, that is such a crazy story. <laughs> Talk about a mind game, huh? Like hmm. getting in your head, playing. I mean, there's a game. He did. A game and, oh, it was beautiful. Man. It was beautiful. <laughs> I, I, yeah, there is a, there's a part of me that's like, hey, good for you. You're looking for every yeah. competitive edge you possibly can think of. Yep. And it came down to what? You said three one-hundredths of a second? Three one-hundredths. Uh, one one-hundredth is half of a little fingernail tramp traveling at that speed. So you can imagine it's a, it's a, it's a little Seriously? Little fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. Swimming is not, you're right, for the faint of heart. I just cannot fathom. So was there ever a race that you, okay, so that one you, you lost. Let, let, yeah. Let's take that one, for example. I mean, did that just eat at you for years? I mean, did you forget mm. it quickly or how did that work? It did. It did. You know, definitely eat it, eats it. Because I lost the 200 that meet too by two 100. So two races by five 100 is, is, is tough to tough to walk away with but um but i will say that you know the valleys that that you, you dig for yourself um you certainly you learn from those experiences and again i'll go back to my coach you know richard was there with me and he um really helped me so much in guiding me out of that that pitfall um, um and uh making it a learning experience so it, it helped tremendously yeah uh, just a couple more questions. I'm curious what, uh, so after you won the Olympic gold medal, uh, first of all, I guess, what was your uh, initial thought, feeling, reaction when you were able to, to win that? Um, and then how did that change your life? Well, it was obviously a wonderful moment for me and, and, and got to do it at home. You know, it's like playing a Super Bowl in your home was that field. In Atlanta? It was in LA, Los LA, Angeles. Okay. Yeah, it was in Los Angeles. And it's going to be back in L.A. in 2028. But, yeah, it was in L.A. And, uh, you know, I don't think I ever swam in front of more than 20 people. And there were 20,000 people, you know. So that, that was really cool. And all the energy and all the love 
I can definitely feel from the crowd. You can really feel that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it, it changed my life in so many ways, obviously. Uh, I mean, it, it, it helps open those doors for sure. And it helped open them in the beginning. And especially during my broadcasting, you know, uh, I started covering the 92 Olympics and then Paris will be um, my ninth Olympic games that I, that I'll cover. And, um, wow. and so it, it definitely, it, it definitely changed things for me. It, it changed the trajectory tremendously. Um, and, uh, I have no regrets. Good. As it should out of curiosity, what would you rather do? Would you rather be swimming in the Olympics or announcing? Well, if I'm at my best, I want to be swimming. Yeah. That's a good question though. I have never been asked that. That's a great question. I mean, if I'm at my best, it, like if I'm in, if I'm 1980 rowdy, um, 1981 rowdy and uh, pick a year for the 2008 rowdy commentating, I felt like that was probably the, the most fun Olympics I ever experienced. Yeah. Um, I would definitely like to swim. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love that. that uh, I love that competitiveness and I, I, I felt so. I feel better in the water than I do on land. If that, I know that sounds so corny, but I'm, I'm just more comfortable in the water than I am on land. It relaxes me. It eases my, my soul. And I know that sounds so stupid, but it, it's, it's just one thing I've always had this love affair with the water. Well, if you swam across the entire globe several <laughs> times over, I, I think it makes perfect sense that you would yeah. do it one. Uh, it would be weird if you didn't, I guess we'll put it that way. That's right. <laughs> um, man, that, that's so cool. So um, if, if you were, uh, I have a couple more questions that I was looking sure. at here. Um, looking back on your experience, um, is there anything that you wish you would have done differently? Um, with your entire experience uh, of of swimming, is there well, certainly when I look back at the boycott year, I probably would have changed things and, and concentrated more on the educational balance of things. You know, instead of being just ninety ten swimming in school, I would have tried to organize more fifty fifty. Even if I knew there was going to boy be a boycott, because I think balance is really important in your life. Yeah. Um, and I didn't have that in eighty. Um, even though that was my best year of swimming it, I think it affected me a lot in, in the fact that I just got a, a, a bit burned out on it and because I didn't have balance. So if there's any regret necessarily, and I don't have many, but if there's any regrets necessarily, it would be, you know, I would probably try to have more balance in my life. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that that's fair enough. Okay. The other uh, question I want to ask you too is, uh, so I can barely even watch sports. I get so anxious because I just, <laughs> I, I can't even watch it live. I have to record the game. I'll find out if they won and then I'll watch it if they won yeah. because I just, there comes a point where I just can't handle it anymore. I just can't handle the stress. Yeah. So I cannot fathom the fact that you just spent four years. I mean, was the thought running through your head as you're getting up to, to the meet and you're about to jump in the water? I mean, does that thought ever go through your head like, man, you know, uh, I better not mess this up or, you know, I've spent all this time doing this. Like, I mean, the stress, I, how in the world do you channel the stress? <laughs> Cause I, I would lose it. I know I, I, I would totally collapse. You're right. That, that's a good point. I do the same thing, man. I went to school at Auburn, like we talked about, and I, I have a hard time watching them live because I get so nervous. And so I got to turn it off and yeah. wait to get the results later. That's I just get so nervous about it but i think a lot of us bj was routine you know you develop a routine in your life i think uh as athletes or anybody that is successful personally professionally you try to get into a routine in your life where it becomes a habit you know a good habit that you try to develop and for me and again my, you know richard really was a great advocate of, of the consistency part but also just being in the mindset, hey, let's just get this done every single day in the same way, not be afraid to take risks, obviously, and do things a little bit differently in the water. But let's get in the mindset of just trying to be consistent in our beliefs and, and, and the ability to get up on the blocks and have it be not necessarily second nature because the Olympics is not second nature, 
but say we've done been there and done that. And I think by 84, to tell you the truth, I was not the best swimmer, man. I w we could have swam that race 10 times and I would have lost nine of them. Um, I, I should have been probably fourth or fifth in that race. But I think I was very relaxed when I got up on the blocks, not relaxed necessarily, I was nervous, but I always felt very proud of my career. And I always felt like, you know what? I'm the underdog here. Nobody's expecting me to win anyway. So I'm just going to go out there and kind of give it a shot yeah. and much different than earlier in my career when I was the favorite and, you, and what you just talked about so hard getting up on the block yeah. and it wasn't that way in 84. I think that helped me a lot. Yeah. Did you have any, um, I guess, jealousy or any, uh, bad thoughts when it came to others beating your world record? And oh yeah. Aren't it? <laughs> of course. Yeah. I hated it. I yeah, it definitely, it, it definitely is a pit in your stomach when you lose your world record. Um, I had one for four years. I, I both for four years. No, five years, one and four years for the other, I think. Anyway, yeah, um, um, yeah it, it's, it's, not an, it's not a good feeling. But I will tell you that, and people ask me all the time, like, you know, what's better, a world record or an Olympic gold medal? I would trade 100 world records. Somebody could say, Roddy, you can break 100 world records during your career. Mm -hmm. Or you can win a one Olympic gold medal. What are you going to choose? Mm -hmm. Every single time, the Olympic gold medal. Wow. Not even, you could say a thousand world records ain't going to change Man. because the world records will always be taken away from you. Yeah. Always. Yeah. You know, Michael Phelps has no more world records. Um, really? But nobody, yeah, you know, I mean, all of his world records have been broken. Wow. Last one happened last summer, 2023. It was the longest standing 15 years, wow. but he has, he has, he's still on a relay that has world records. Um, yeah, two, actually th two relays, but but individually, he has no world records left. So they're all going to be taken away from you, but nobody will ever take that gold medal away. So Never. What so a great I'll, answer. I'll, yeah, that yeah, is. I'll always have that. Yeah. And records are meant to be broken, you know. Yeah, obviously. absolutely. I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but yeah, sure they are. So it doesn't mean you you don't like, you don't, I mean, I, I didn't like losing them, no doubt about it. But it, in the end, it was that feeling of, of, not regret, but feeling those bad feelings, as you mentioned, it, it didn't last long, you know, Yeah. Oh man. a couple That's days and I was over it. <laughs> such a good answer. Rowdy, this has been an absolute pleasure. Cannot thank you enough for coming on the show and yeah, would love to, uh, to learn more in, in, I guess we'll, we'll hear more about, you know, not necessarily your story, but I'm sure we'll hear more from you, uh, in the next Olympics, which you mentioned is in Paris and that's in, wait, is that this? Is that this year? This summer. Yeah. yeah. This summer go, uh, in July. Right? Yep. The end of July it's will be the I'm Paris. Like, Wait a minute. 2024. Yeah. 2024. The Paris Olympic Games are in six months. Oh, um, so that it's, is it's, so awesome. So you get all expense paid to go to Paris, <laughs> enjoy your time there, and yep. uh, do what you love. It's going to be fun. That's a good life. Well, Rowdy, thanks so much for coming on the show. I sure appreciate it. Thank you, buddy.